uh, we are here with the Audrey Flavius and Lee. He uh, is a Canadian, first generation born of uh, Lithuanian immigrants, uh, refugees from the Soviet Union. Um, he went on to become a renowned neurologist and a professional artist. In 2011, he organized the Hope and Spirit exhibition uh, in which he talked about the experiences of Lithuanians who were deported and sent to Soviet concentration camps. So, Adris, you mentioned in the Letters from Siberia, which I uh, already translated, they, I will link the, the video in the description, that um, some of our uh, family members suffered the repression from the communist government. Isn't that correct? That's correct, yes. <laughs> Do you know what your uh, family members did for a living, especially your uh, grandmother and what they did for a living? Were they really uh, cool as uh, rich bourgeoisie? The, um, the, uh, I just wanted to explain. The, the project that I did, Hope and Spirit, that was exactly 10 years ago that I launched it. And it was in the middle of, uh, of June, like, like it is now approaching middle of June. And on June 13th, uh, now 80 years ago, is the day that the deportations all started in Lithuania and in Latvia and Estonia, in the Baltic Republics. So 10 years ago, it was the 70 year anniversary of the start of all of the Stalinistic terror that started taking place in June of 1941. And now it's 80 years. And the anniversary is coming up uh, in just uh, what ten days or so the start of it. So, so, so it's a very appropriate time for us to be talking about the, this event, right? You know, which, which happened exactly eighty years ago. Now, the among my own blood relatives, um, uh, four of my blood relatives, including both of my grandfathers. Uh, died during or as a consequence of NKVD interrogations. Now, for all of these individuals, their, their crime and why they were interrogated was because they had small family farms. They were farmers and they had land. And nobody in Lithuania then, you know, these are not uh, American style giant enterprises and uh, most of everything was there were very little in the way of tractors, for example. Everything was horse-drawn uh, equipment at that time. So that uh, to consider people to be extremely wealthy was absurd. Um, uh, they just happened to own land and other people did, and that was their basic crime. Now, uh, our own blood relatives, uh, 12 were deported to Siberia. The vast majority of them also because uh, they were landowners. They had something. And that was the cause for most of the people's deportation. You owned land. You owned a violin. You owned a, a piano. You owned, uh, you had a, an education. Teachers, lawyers, doctors, because they were educated. They owned something of value. Get rid of them. They're potential trouble for the future society. We have to get rid of them. So that the reason for deportations was really uh, minimal. Uh, at that time, anyone who was con per per perceived as possible threat, just get rid of them. It's very, very easy to kill them or deport them. Now, the only blood relative that I've had personal experience with was my grandmother. Uh, she was uh, a farm woman, uh, working on a farm her entire life. She was really not literate because she didn't know how to read and write but without an education. Uh, she uh, uh, was 71 years old when she was deported to Siberia. And in her particular case, she was accused of providing food to partisans. Uh, these were uh, uh, people fighting against the Red Army that she was supporting. She was not actually doing that, but neighbors were upset at her and wanted to, uh, to um, uh, sort of um, uh, teach her a lesson, and so they did. And there, were, there was no evidence at all. All it was is that they accused her of it, and that's all it took. She was sentenced to 12 years in Siberia, ended up serving eight years because then Stalin eventually died and people were allowed to return. And she came back. 
And uh, uh, when she was back in Lithuania, my father and my uncle, uh, year, every single year, filled out papers to have her uh, come, come either to Canada, where I was living, or my uncle in the United States, to, to, to leave uh, and, and come to better circumstances. And, and, and that was constantly denied. She can't leave. Until, until her health started to deteriorate. Now, this was, she was 71 years of age when she was deported. She was 79 when she came back to Lithuania and she was still working full time on the, on the, uh, um, on the farms. You know, these are now collective farms and she was working there um, for quite a few years and through eighties until she wasn't able to do it anymore. Physically wasn't able to do it and she was going blind from cataracts. And so she, since she was no longer useful, they, they allowed her to leave. So that's how I met her. And for a few years, she lived in the United States, and, and then she passed away. Now, uh, when I met her, I, I spoke with her about her experiences there. And, and she was now a 71-year-old woman uh, 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 sent to a, lab- to a uh, lumber camp to chop trees. And uh, so that's, she had no experience with axes or chopping trees or doing anything like that at all, but that was her assigned job. And so she did the best that she could. And, and on my website, uh, the Hope and Spirit website, there's a photo of her sitting next to a tree that she helped to chop down. But uh, very early on in her stay there, she did not knowing how to use axes, she accidentally chopped herself in the leg, in her leg. Now, normally that would be a lethal accident, you know, because you still have to go work, you have to do things, um, and, 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 you know, with minimal, no, no, no real health, health providing, health care being provided. But what happened is the, the, there were a large number of families that were smaller kids, and winter was starting to come along, and so she was reassigned to a different job to kind of take care and, and to educate children. And so the children were provided um, a, a warmth environment, you know, where uh, uh, a, a place to stay where there was heat and warmth and food. And so, and she prepared the food for them and educated them, took care of them. And so she was able to survive those eight years that she was there because of that particular circumstance. So out of a, a tragedy that would normally have been, you know, killed you, it turned out to be life-saving for her. The, uh, what she told me is that uh, during the, the uh, particularly the winters in Siberia were particularly difficult, and during each of the each year during the winters, about one third of the people living there died from starvation, cold exposure, overwork. The the permafrost ground in the winter times uh, it was you couldn't you couldn't uh, chop into it in solid ice. So they have to. So the bodies were simply stacked up like logs uh, in one place, uh, waiting for the spring thaw, and then when the permafrost thawed, then the bodies were buried each year. But each year it was about 30 percent, and more and more people were, you know, every year deported uh, to to that to that uh, to that uh, uh, work plant, right, to that uh, kind of prison camp area. So that 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 was her experience, and then when she came back, of course, with when she had to work on the on the farm. She was with her husband. They were owners of the, had to have been owners of the farm. But when she came back, it was now a collective farm. And she just had the day, although she lived in the same house, she just had a small room there and uh, worked on the, uh, on the fields and uh, helped out. So that, that's the only person that I had experience with. My mother's uh, uh, cousin wrote down her experience, and I think you read it, it's translated in English. I never met her myself or any contact directly so that all there is is that uh, that document which uh, you, you've seen and, and read and uh, I don't have nothing else to add to that at all. Um, the cousin of your mother, uh, he was uh, also accused of being uh, a Kulag, yeah, and was uh, reported in Siberia as well. He spent, a, a, uh, she said, uh, there eight years in Siberia four of which was spent in a, in, a, in a farm, in a collective farm. He mentioned that uh, her husband had pneumonia and her son, a uh, little son, he was with him, he had a kidney inflammation. 
And uh, there's a, a passage which is the, which the, she stated that, uh, I, and I quote, I have washed all the paths in Siberia for eight years. So it's a, it's a, it's tough to read uh, the account, you know. Uh, but you mentioned uh, the, the husband of her and mother who was, I believe, also arrested. Uh, what to, uh, what came, uh, what happened to, to, to him? I have no information other than what's there, nothing. Okay. I never met these people, and then by the time I, mean, I was starting to do my family history and everything, everyone had passed away. So that um, this, this is just, uh, we have a correspondence that, uh, that she wrote everything down and sent it to my mother, and my mother kept it, and so that's how we had access to that information. But there's nothing else additional that I can add or all there's no information. All the people there have passed away, so there's no access that I've ever had. And when did you became uh, interested in, in this? Was it uh, any kind of a topic uh, in your family? People talk about it. It was it was a constant thing when I was growing up in Toronto, Canada. Um, my parents uh, fled. Both, both my father and mother fled from Lithuania, knowing that if they stayed, that they would be killed. They were, they were, to stay there would be death. They knew that. And so they, they, they fled. But they just not that they wanted to leave their home country. They fully expected to uh, come back to Lithuania. And so they were married in Toronto, Canada, where I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. And their expectation was that that, that the United States Army, the Allied Army, is not going to allow the Red Army to keep all of these in Europe. That this will be liberated again, that they'll be able to go home. So that when I was growing up, uh, there was I was not taught English language at all. Uh, just Lithuanian with my sister, only Lithuanian. And uh, uh, so that when I when when the first grade came started, I had to go to school for first grade. I remember that day very well. My mother took me there, left me there, and I didn't know a single word of English. And so I was yelling and screaming and crying all day long. That's a very memorable day in my life. Uh, but then I eventually learned English. My parents brought bought a television set, and I was showing old old time uh, black and white television set. And I, I learned English from watching children's shows, a, a particular show called How Do You Do the a puppet which is a popular TV show. So that's why my English is not very good. It's very childish still. I left it for a learned English show. So, and then the entire growing up experience in Toronto, Canada, it was still the idea that eventually we'll be moving back. The whole family will be. And the things that happened in Lithuania as we became known about the killings and the, and the deportations and the suffering that people had, was was uh, uh, everyday knowledge every day uh, when uh, we went to you know Sundays to church it was mentioned all the time uh, at any kind of Lithuanian historical events taking place or festivals it was always mentioned uh, my parents uh, people who were sent to Siberia were able to survive only because of packages that their relatives sent so my parents my uncles they all sent packages regularly to support. Uh, my grandmother and other people in Lithuania and in, in Siberia, so that they have clothes and, and, and food. So, so a good portion of our income went to support these people. So this was part of my entire life growing up. And, and since it was such a you know, significant part of my life, you know, and, and, and I knew it extremely well and the suffering people had, you'd think that you know, the general community would sort of know about it too. But when I, as I became an adult, and then both in Canada and in the United States, it really stunned me how any how few people knew about Stalin and what he had done. And, you know, the knowledge of Hitler was everyone knew that how terrible that was. But Stalin, who did more killing than Hitler did, considerably maybe several times, uh, what uh, what uh, what Hitler had done, is not known. Just just forgotten about. So that when I had an opportunity, this was about 10 years ago, um, um, I had to leave medical practice and my work because of health issues and it was no longer possible to work. But then 
when my health started to come back and uh, starting to do better. Uh, and with the 70 year anniversary of the deportations, uh, I thought this is a, a good opportunity to uh, bring this entire experience, not just Lithuania, but the Baltic Republics, all of Eastern Europe, to the uh, attention of the American public and do something about it. So it was a program that really ran for one year at the Balzacus Museum of uh, Lithuanian Culture in Chicago. The, 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 but then about six months beforehand, preparing it, and six months afterwards, documenting everything, pulling all the all the videos together and imaging all the all the all the, all the documents we found. And it was a very so that it took up two years of my life, um, and and it was the most successful exhibit in the museum's history in terms of public relations, in terms of press coverage, in terms of media coverage that the museum's ever had. And even 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 including the past ten years, so it, it was successful in terms of getting the word out and, and that I that I had wanted to do. So so it, 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 in that regard, it was good and it, it, and it did work. So I'm really proud. So that's how this all happened and, and how it evolved. And do you know anyone uh, in Canada who has uh, this the same kind of background as you? I mean, uh, suffer. Uh, Uh, deportation and fled the uh, Soviet Union. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, do you know anyone whose family also fled uh, the Soviet Union? Because uh, I know that uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the uh, Golden Archipelago, uh, also went to Canada. So, do you know anyone else? Oh, there's a very, very large community of people, a very, very large number. Of, of Lithuanians left after World, after World War II. And the, the city that the largest uh, population moved to was Chicago. And after that, the second largest would be Toronto. So there was a very, very large number of families and people that moved, like my parents, my uncles. So that, um, and then across the United States and other cities, smaller numbers. But, the, but it was really a very, very large number of people escaped. About one third of the population of Lithuania escaped. The general, the general way is about one third left and went to the west. One third stayed, and one third were deported or killed to Siberia. So that that's kind of the general picture of what happened in Lithuania. So it was uh, the total number of people left probably like a million. But I'm, I'm not I'm not a historian in that those those kind of details. But it was a very, very large Lithuanian community in Toronto where I grew up, uh, and it, in the same situation, you know. Their parents uh, were from Lithuania, and we were born and raised in, in, in Canada. Uh, and you mentioned in the, the video that you made, uh, the historic Tepliopis, you mentioned that your father uh, eventually went up to Germany before immigrating to the United States. Uh, uh, he fought the, the, the Russians in Lithuania before going to the United States. I find that uh, interesting because um, the, the Russians at that point was, they were, they aligned and they fought Hitler. And uh, Solzhenitsyn also states in the, the Kulagir Archipelago that um, a great many number of uh, Russians uh, joined the Nazis to, to fight the Russians. So uh, the reign of terror that Stalin imposed was so great they were willing to delay the defeat of Hitler to try to get the, their countries free again. So I found that uh, interesting that you mentioned. Did your father ever uh, ever uh, talk with you about the, uh, his experience in fighting yeah. the, the Russians? No, the, the thing about it was that um, I was involved in school, educating, medical school, doing everything. And <coughs> And, and so very preoccupied with life's activities and, and besides medical school doing my artwork and and the only time that it became possible for me to devote them, which I wanted to I planned to talk to my father get information from pull the family history together uh, after I finished my internship but a year before that he passed away so I never had a chance to talk to him directly about his events his life events So it was after his death, and actually his death motivated me to collect my family history to document it. And, and, and all that material has been pulled together and, and, and done. And the vast majority of people 
whose reminiscences are included in my family history books of family history are all passed away. So that if you try to do it now, it doesn't exist. It's all, it's all gone, except for what I did over the past 40, 40, 45 years collecting it. Now, my father, so, so the information that I have was obtained from uh, other relatives. So it's not direct. It may not be totally accurate. But my, during the war, my father uh, worked for Lithuanian police as a border guard. Uh, the Pleopolis village was not far from uh, the Prussian border, now the Kaliningrad border. And he worked as a border policeman, border guard. Then when the, uh, the, the, the Red Army was coming back for the second time, uh, and, and he had to flee, like most uh, Lithuanians, ended up in Germany. Other people, my one uncle ended up in Czechoslovakia. But uh, when they fled, most were ended up in Germany. But when, when he was in Germany, uh, there was still, the war was going. It had not ended yet. And my, and the way the story uh, the understanding is he volunteered to help uh, to work with uh, uh, the, uh, the German army at anti-aircraft battery to shoot down Russian planes. So he, he was a sort of volunteer. Well, he wasn't a member of the Nazi party. He was not a member of the German army. He just helped to, to do that, to, to shoot down the plane. So. Um, uh, so, of course, now you end up with a kind of a peculiar situation because uh, the planes were, 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 were headed to destroy Hitler, you know, which is a good thing to do, but at the same, but, but at the same, uh, so, so that you have to shoot them down, you think is bad. But when you look at the historical aftermaths that, uh, 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 of, of what happened, that means all of Eastern Europe was under a Stalinist oppression, the millions of people that he'd been subsequently killed. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a very honorable thing that my father did. Uh, that's something that I'm proud of. On top of that, you have to realize the historical detail of who started the war. Who started World War II? It wasn't Hitler. It was Hitler and Stalin together. They had the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. And which they signed months before the actual battle started. And so it was Russia started the World War, equal to Hitler. So that uh, to, to, to shoot down Russian planes, I think, was a very, very honorable thing. And anyway, that's my opinion. I'm proud of, of what my father did. And do you, do you think that it's uh, appropriate to compare uh, the concentration camps of Hitler and uh, Stalin. Do you think that it's proper to compare them? Oh yeah, As, absolutely. Because yeah, uh, the, the, historically, my understanding is this: is that when Hitler was planning to start uh, building concentration camps, he had a, delega a good delegation of SS uh, 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 SS people go to Russia and visit Stalin's death camps and see what Stalin was doing in the death camps where he was set up. Now, Germans with German ingenuity came back with that information and then improved on it massively, made it much better. So that, so that, they're very, so that the, the, the German death camps originated from the Stalin's death camps, but, but they were made much more efficient, much more you know, German ingenuity, German engineering at work. And so, so, so that that's it. So that yeah, you I think it's totally correct to compare them. And now, uh, the way the way things happened because of the German ingenuity, you know, the mass murder that took place wasn't it, it never never took place in a similar fashion. It was different. They didn't have the Russia did not uh, have gas chambers like like the Germans did. So that 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 was an additional technological advancement that that that, that, that the Nazis came up with. So they're not totally the same. But, but I think that we're comparable enough, and you know, where the one came out of the other. And if you read the, the, the accounts of the people who survived, you'll see that our experiences are very similar. And uh, one thing that I found interesting uh, in reading the accounts of people who survived, uh, they, they, they say that um, was the concentration camps, all the death and deportation, was only... Uh, Stalin that uh, fault. It was only due to Stalin. And they, you know, uh, we now know that the, the camps and all of it, all of it 
started with planning, by order planning. And um, do you think that this, uh, this death and all of it is a hairy part of the communist ideology or it, it is just uh, one thing that occurred with Lenin or Stalin? Or? Well, I think historically speaking, deportations uh, 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 are much older history. It goes into Tsarist Russia. There are waves of deportations from the early 1800s taking place. I know from Lithuania because of uh, revolutions that took place against Tsarist Russia. After apprehend people and deport them to Siberia was sort of a long-standing tradition. So Lenin did not invent it. There was something that, that, that was there. Now, in terms of details about what camps and and prisons out in Siberia and how they were handled, that may have been different from, from the Tsar's days to Lenin and Stalin, very much so. But uh, but the concept of deportation is a long-standing Russian tradition. And uh, what would you say to the people in, the, in Brazil, especially from the communist part of Brazil, who refuse to acknowledge uh, Stalin's crime well, you know, this, it's, it, 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 it's, what can I say? It, it's ignoring a gigantic portion of history, selectively ignoring it, which is idiotic. It's idiotic. It's stupid, idiotic. And, and if you claim it, uh, it, it never happened, then you're lying. It is blatant lying. So that, 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 that's the only thing I can say about it. It, uh, it makes no sense. You know, um, you know, I, I can imagine, I can imagine that a person could still be a, a, you know, kind of understand their own worldview of communism and be a good person and have have an idea that the Communist Party could do good things for society. And but but you have to acknowledge the bad things that did occur, and you have to make sure that nothing like that ever happened again. So I can imagine that that would be the case. But as you pointed out, you know, ignoring everything is the way people tend to do. And, 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 that, and certainly my little experience in the United States with uh, what I've known about the Communist Party here, too, is the same thing. They just ignore what happened as if it never happened. And that, 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 that to me is in, incomprehensible. It's total stupidity and incomprehensible. And uh, I believe now we are heading to, to the end. I, I just want to talk uh, a little bit about yourself. Um, you went to University of Chicago. To, start, uh, to study uh, atomic physics, and you went, uh, and you, uh, went out to study, study uh, medicine. Never have you ever thought on majoring in history or anything like that? Well, no, just history is just, 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 just you know, just, it, it, I grew up in the world of history, so that it, 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 no, I, I didn't do any specific historical studies in my in my education. No. And why 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 did you turn to medicine? Oh, this is interesting because I went to University of Chicago. It was one. Of, it was and still is one of the top uh, atomic physics uh, education centers in the world. And I went there to to try and understand what matter is, what, what, what makes up atoms, what makes up all the subatomic particles. Now that time, which was a long time ago, uh, quarks had just been hypothesized. So and new, new particles were being discovered every week almost. So it was a very exciting time in atomic physics then. And so, so I thought, you know, going to one of the best institutions, that's ideal, it's wonderful to do that. Now, everything was going well until I started my second year of college. And then uh, uh, this requirement showed up. The requirement was that I have to do a year of biology. And I couldn't understand why do I have to do biology? It was got nothing to do with physics, mathematics. I have no interest in, in frogs or lizards or anything like that. So I went to my advisor and he, and I, and I, and who was the chairman of the department of chemistry. And I pleaded with, please, please, don't let me do that. I'll, I'll study Greek. I'll do Aristotle, Plato, anything, anything. Just, just not this. And he says, well, okay, you know, the problem is this. I can let you. I can let you do it. But the problem is after four years, you will not get a degree. You'll graduate, but no degree. Because you need to do, they have to do the biology. Okay, so I said, oh, okay. I went there. Very sad. I'm happy. Wasting my time. 
the person, the teacher, Richard Mentel, who was the teacher of this course, who recently graduated, recently finished college, he was incredibly interesting, incredibly dynamic person. Sometimes he'd even stand up on the table and, and as he's so excited about what he's talking about. But when he got to the brain and how the mind works, it just blew me away, absolutely blew me away. How is it that this organ in our head, a hundred um, uh, you know, a billion neurons, which is smaller than our liver, smaller than you know, the number of cells in our liver, produces thinking? How does it produce consciousness? Produces us as human beings, produces society. How does that happen? Then I started thinking, you know, that, that question is much more interesting than what this table in front of me is made out of. And that, that, that's when I realized that that's when I shifted into neurology and, and, and into medicine. It was specifically to do neurology, and not general medicine, that I did that. So that's how that particular thing happens. It's the influence of a teacher, a specific teacher. And when did you start your artistic career? My which career? Your artistic career. Oh, that was during medical school. When I was uh, growing up in Toronto, uh, uh, my best friend who was about two years older than me. He was a, a very, a very delinquent fellow. And uh, for example, he was 13 years old and he already had a motorcycle. And I don't know where he got the money for it and, and how he did it, but it was fun sitting on the motorcycle. He driving me around Toronto then, a, a little kid. The, um, but one summer, the parents tried to keep him out of trouble and put him into art school. And so I would come and I would watch him uh, at, at his house, take a, a canvas, a white piece uh, of canvas, and then lines would show up, dark charcoal lines, and then colored. And eventually, you have a painting, a beautiful landscape. So he took nothing and made something beautiful out of nothing. I couldn't believe it. That's a blue well, that was the seed for art. It grew slowly throughout my entire life. And it started really blossoming when I was in medical school. So I started painting more and more and more. And by the time I finished medical school, I was in a quandary. I said, well, maybe I made a mistake. I should have gone into art. So uh, I finished my internship. And then I dropped out entirely of medicine, out of neurology. Went to the East Coast of the United States and did art full time for three years. And so, and, and I've continued to do art uh, ever since. I eventually went back to do neurology, and I've, I've combined both neurology, neuroscience research, and my art all, all at the same time. Yeah, uh, I was just going to ask you, uh, you have this, this series, the artistic exploration of thought, and you have those uh, colorful patterns. What are those patterns? I'm sorry, the water of those what? The, the colorful patterns in your uh, artistic exploration of thought the series. How are they, they done? Uh, I, I, I like color very much. It sort of it stimulates and makes things very interesting and, and lively. The, um, 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 and to me, visual art has to be engaging visually. It has to attract viewers. I put a lot of content in my work. A lot of layers, for example, my pieces include my own electroencephalograms, my brain waves, my brain scans, previous transformed artwork. And, and there's a lot of reasons why I include a different layer. So there's a lot of content in there. So actually it's conceptual. I consider this to be conceptual art. But I also want it to be visually appealing, visually interesting. And that's where color comes in. And color makes it alive. Color makes it uh, a, a, a living, more, more of a living thing, and so, so the, so that that's how. So most of my, all my re most recent work is, uh, I've, I've done many, many over the years, decades, many different techniques, uh, oil painting, uh, uh, drawings, uh, watercolors, uh, photography, all kinds of uh, indoor, outdoor installations, uh, light sculptures, LED light sculptures in the last couple of years, which have been very popular and very successful, uh, so that uh, with environmental uh, kind of effects. And then a lot of my, my uh, recent work is all digital, uh, digital things. And then I print them on paper or print them on large scale on canvas. And a lot of the pieces are very big. We're talking like uh, pieces that are 
uh, three and a half meters by seven meters in size. which are very, very large, large pieces. So um, and incorporate many different elements. So, so that the visual part of it is, I think, as a, as a piece of visual, it's very important. It's sort of colors play an important role in, 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 in these works. And they also include neuronal patterns and thinking and consciousness. That, that's the underlying theme of all my work. And have you ever made a, or thought of making an exhibit on Latin America or in Brazil? I've never been to Brazil, ever. <laughs> I've never been. Well, the, the farthest south I've gone to is uh, Cancun in Mexico. <laughs> so so I, I've never been there. I should, I should visit at some point, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's important. You are correct. It's, Latin America is an important part of the world. And um, do you plan on uh, make uh, other inquiries about Stalin in the future, or the project is done? Well, the, my artwork uh, after the entire installation and, and the Open Sphere project was 10 years ago. Uh, it was very successful. I'm not going to be repeating that particular thing. I took elements out of that and, and created a series, of, a series of light sculptures called Siberia Souls, which were very popular. And there were lots of exhibits of the light sculptures in different locations. Uh, they, were, they, they, they were the uh, exhibit of the week by, in Chicago by the Chicago Tribune. Uh, that's the main newspaper in the Chicago area. When they were exhibited in, in, in a very large exhibit in Grand Rapids, Michigan in one month, There were about 17,000 people saw it, uh, so they did attract a lot of attention. The um, and so I was, I was getting that, uh, so my artwork did incorporate that entire series. Those are the light sculptures, and then I also created prints on paper, Siberia's souls, and the uh, and I've exhibited them, and, and, and a, a series of it is up on exhibit right now at the Baltacus Museum of Plain Culture in Chicago. They, if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh, last June, uh, they were supposed to have an exhibit in New York City in the Chelsea area of the Siberia Souls. Uh, but the pandemic um, ended it maybe, uh, maybe, next, maybe next June I'll have that exhibit take place. And then that, that same series, uh, Siberia Souls, will be displayed in Lithuania in, in, in September, an exhibit uh, that's going to be there at the museum. Uh, I'll be out there at that time. So... So that, that the, the, the issue of Siberian deportations hasn't stopped and it's, in, it's incorporated in my artwork now and in art exhibits that are up, that have been up, are up and will be up and, and, and I'll continue showing them as long as there's interest in people wanting to see these, these pieces. Oh, I, I believe we are done. Is there something that would, you would like to say to the Brazilians who will watch it? Well, I want to thank you, Paulo, for all your efforts and energy and work about this, this entire subject. You know, it, 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 it seems to me that uh, we had one thing in common. We both know about the, the history of Stalin and what he did, and the Japanese appreciate the horror of it, and understand the horror. But that, uh, but that the uh, 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 general community It doesn't know it, and in some cases, that he wants to deny it, which is incomprehensible. And and you're doing something about it. You're trying. I, I tried to do what I could about it, and you're doing it. So so I want to compliment you and commend you for all the efforts that you're doing. And I think uh, a round of applause for Paula. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, for me, it was uh, an honor to be able to make it. You know. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, first for letting me do this and uh, for doing this amazing work that you did, that you did the exhibit. It was not just for, for you or for uh, the Lithuanians, it was something for the whole humanity, you know. Yeah. So thank you for uh, letting me do this and to, to all the effort that you did to help me with that. So, who knows, maybe by next year uh, we can meet in Chicago. I don't know, I, I, I plan to go to the University of Chicago, maybe we can meet. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, be glad to see you. Wow. <laughs> I'm on so, campus a lot, I'm over there a lot. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it's taking place.